Hi, this is Beth from Around the Table Yarns. This is part three of the I'm So Basic Sock by Summerly, Summerly, not Summerly Socks. Um, and we are going to be working on the toes, but we had a question from uh, one of our participants about um, using magic loop when there are so many stitches. And uh, this also came up in our earlier class today. And so I wanted to take a second to answer this question. So I'm gonna do it with paper and pencil because I don't have my knitting in exactly the place. So I'm gonna turn on my camera. Hello, back this up a little so you can see more of the paper. And all right, so the, when we get to the point in the sock, so this is actually, you know, a little bit ago, but it, there's one point in the sock where you resume working in the round and your work is essentially a, par, uh, a trapezoid. This is a trapezoid. It's not a parallelogram, it's a trapezoid. And this is the original number of stitches up here. And this is a much increased number because these are the end of the heel turn and then the picked up stitches on each side of the gusset. So like, let's say this was 20 stitches. This is way more than 20 stitches. So the conversation was that in our last class, we talked about that the decreases happen here at the tops of these trapezoids. Like at the top here is where you're gonna decrease one by SSK, right? And then this is the one that you're gonna knit two together, unless I'm getting that wrong. And I could be getting that backwards. So I'm just doing it off the top of my head. I think I might be backwards. Um, so that might be the knit two together knit two together, and this is the SSK. But regardless, you do it right at the top, not on the instep. Those That original number stays the same. And you do the knit two together here and the SSK here. So what I had suggested is that the beginning of the round start here, but that the needles be arranged so that the loop came out here and the needle tips were here, and you worked this as one half, and you worked all of these stitches as the second half. Sarah, is that correct so far? Yes, I yes, I think so. My so it was suggested in class that this be the place where the loop is, and that halfway through the instep stitches be the point where the two needle tips are coming out. Where, in other words, the point of changing the round, the, the beginning of the round would be also the point of changing the orientation of the needle. In other words, this number and this number would be the same but you would have to keep track of which one was the beginning and was the knit two together side and which one was the SSK. Does that make uh, sense? That does make sense. And you would probably want like more markers in that case. I've been able to get away with no well, markers Well, you don't need them. Now. If you're doing magic loop, these are just separated, but you could have maybe different color markers to identify. So this could be yeah. green and that's your you know, that's your knit two together side, and this is your blue marker, and that's your SSK side. Yeah, I think uh, that makes sense. My my struggle was trying to get all of those, those stitches onto the needle itself. That was like, right. the hard part. So thank you. That's a good idea. So this, so this is another way of orienting it so that you can have the same number. So what that means is that in a round, here's side one, there's a decrease. In side two, there's also a decrease. And then there's a round where both side one and side two don't get decreased. That makes sense. Okay. Um, so that came up in class today. Uh, apparently the original knitting on a uh, magic loop book that came out that uh, some of the participants this morning had used always recommended doing it this way. 
And I think uh, you'll also remember that Summer Lee doesn't have you switch here. This is not her beginning of the round. Her beginning of the round is here before the decrease in this direction. So that this is the first decrease. This is the first half of the round or the second half, I can't remember. And then you decrease again before you get to the end of that needle and then switch needles. So, um, so it's in that same orientation of having all of the bottom stitches, the bottom of the foot stitches on one needle, all of the top of the foot stitches on another needle, but she was calling this the beginning of the round and then coming back to here. So uh, any way you slice it, it's still cake. So it's okay to do to decide that it's easier for you to, to split them in half this way instead of this way, especially since that's not half. So if it makes it easier for you to have the same number of stitches on each needle, you have to orient it this way. If you do that, when you get to the part that we're at, which is the toe, you have to reorient it so that your needles are switching here, not here because otherwise your toe will run vertically. Does that make sense? Yes, that does make sense. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. No, that was a great question. Um, so today, what we're gonna talk about, what I'm gonna demonstrate today is just this, the simplest thing, this, the shaping of the toes. So we're here at the top of one foot and I'm gonna do the shaping of the toes on this foot. Um, with the contrast color yarn. And then um, I have my other toe ready to do the, the grafting on. And so I'm gonna demonstrate the grafting on that one. And those are the two other things that we're gonna cover today so that we've recorded them, especially since we've changed how we do SSAs. And I want to have a video where we do it the new way, the kimono sleeve way, as opposed to our old way of doing SSKs. And ask me now if that sounds unfamiliar to either of you. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so I'm breaking off my working yarn from my other sock. And I'm done with my working yarn. I have this much left. That looks like that could be something, doesn't it? And I'm going to Leave a long tail. So to, to rejoin the yarn, I just want to be at the beginning of my round. So my round is starting here on the right hand side of my heel side of my sock. Make sure that I'm in exactly the right place. And I'm just going to work. So the pattern says to work even one round after you've joined your contrast color. And this was a question in the class this morning. Somebody had not heard the term or did not understand the term working even. And I always find this interesting because there are some secret knitting language things that are not easily found in a book about how to knit. And working even is one of those terms. Working even means to continue on the stitches that you have without changing the pattern or the number of stitches. So for example, if I were doing a sweater and I was uh, working in the round, after the hem of the sweater and I was coming, I was working up from the hem, I might have adjusted the number of stitches after the ribbing, but until I get to the armhole, it's possible that I would have no change in the number of stitches. And so often in those cases, the pattern might say work even for 12 inches. In this case, we're working even for just one round. So remembering that around is both the bottom and the top of our sock. I'm finishing the bottom and flipping over for the magic loop. And I am doing the magic loop on super long. 
want to double check this because I was I was playing around with my needles. I want to make sure that I'm in the right place. So to check that, my um this was the halfway point of my of my stitches previously. And I want to just kind of fold them along there and make sure that that's where I'm starting the beginning of my round. No, I got messed up. So I'm gonna follow that all the way up to here and count. I've got three, six, seven, eight stitches. So what I'm going to do, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 21, 22, 4, 6, 8, yep. So I'm just going to reposition my needles by moving that spot onto the cable and pinching and pulling the cable through here before continuing to the end of this. So I was eight stitches off from, the, that's from me uh, just moving my stitches over. Onto Does the, needle. the number of stitches in the round at this point matter? The number of stitches at this point should be the same as your cast on, should be the same as your foot. You have not, de so once you finished your gusset shaping, you should have resumed the correct number, the whole number for the, the foot. Okay, does it, does it matter if it's even or odd? Um, it should be even. All right. Are your stitches an even number? Well, I have to do one more decrease on one side or something okay. like that is what happened. But like, I'm just curious if, if it matters because we like things to be even or if it matters because we're about to do something where we need <laughs> half and half. So what we're about to do is this. Yeah. And this is two decreases on each side. So there's a decrease here and a decrease here. And then on the other side as well. So if I'm decreasing two stitches, so if this was yeah. 33 and the other one was 35 or the other one was 31, yeah. then I would have an unequal number of stitches. So the top of my foot might be two mm -hmm. stitches more, or one stitch more than the bottom of my foot. In yeah. the greater scheme of things, that might not be a big deal. One stitch went either way, right. but um, in the smaller Thing of <laughs> having things be symmetric it's it's up to you whether you want it to be that symmetric thank you um and especially because maybe it's just a matter of doing what I did and moving one stitch to the other needle like if these if I had the even number here 32 and 32 if I moved one over from the other needle I'd have 33 and 31 right yeah might be recoverable, makes sense. So it might be recoverable. It depends on if the total number of stitches is even or odd. Yeah. Okay. So I've worked one round in the round. Um, one of the things we talked about, and one of the things I really encourage people to consider, there are lots of different ways to shape the toe of a sock. And this is a whole different parallelogram. In, in some ways. So if I'm doing the toe of my sock and my, you know, your feet are kind of shaped like this, right? And my feet are pretty wide at the top. It looks like I have eight feet. <laughs> there. And now I have five toes, like a, like a normal person or like a person with five toes. <laughs> she tells you to start the toe shaping when the body of your sock reaches the top of your pinky toe <laughs> when you try it on or about an inch and a half short of the total length of your sock. So if you're making it for somebody else and you're using you know, a size based on a shoe size, um, then you wanna be about an inch and a half from the beginning or from the end of your, your toe. So the, the way that sock shaping happens, 
they usually decrease one stitch every other row and make a shape like this. And they get to about a little bit less than half the original number of stitches total when they get to the top. So if my total was 64, they get to like uh, 30, 30 or 28 stitches total, which is a little bit less than what half of my original number would be. And so they're decreasing every other row and it makes a much steeper or a much, you know, more of an angle, more acute of an angle in this direction. And um, I find that a little bit restrictive on my feet. So I actually like to do the top of my sock at a slightly less steep angle and I do it every third. So if this has one row in between, I have two rows in between. And I don't do as many decreases. And so I have more stitches left at the top to, to bind off than if I did it this way. So it's a little bit closer to a tube sock top, but that's just more comfortable for me. So I just want to invite you as uh, you're discovering your preferences for sock knitting. If you like a different angle and you don't want as acute an angle as, as tipped in an angle, if you want it to be a little bit more straight, it's okay if you um, change your, but, but do record what you do and make it repeatable. There are other people who like to do the, you know, one every two, and then they go to every row and they have a much steeper angle at the top and they create, you know, an even shorter number of stitches, an even lower number of stitches to graph together later. And all of these are acceptable. Um, there are even people, Kate Atherley is somebody who decreases until she has a very small number of stitches and then she cinches them together and she avoids doing grafting altogether. And that's our, our sock next time. So that's just a, a little note to say, you get to do what you want to fit your own foot if you're making your own socks. So do you... Did I understand that the way you like to do yours is a little more rounded? <clears throat> do you start decreasing sooner? No, I do my round. I, I, my toe is slightly shorter. So I've decreased this toe every third row. Okay. So I did my first decrease and then I worked two rows before I decreased again instead of just one round. Sorry, round. So I did two rounds. So my angle, this angle here, is not as acute as if I had done it every other round. That would have that would have come in more. And you end up with more stitches than to graph. Yes, I have more stitches at the top to grab, okay. but I like okay. that because I have great big shovel shaped feet. <laughs> okay. So for me, that makes sense. And that feels more comfortable. I was wearing out the toes of my socks more. And so I like this better. Bernie, who's just joined us, may have other ways of doing her toes. No, I do them the same way you do. Um... Every third? No, I do it every second, but I'm going to go to every third because I, I do the same thing. I wear out my toes. Yeah. So I think I think you can preserve your toes a little longer if you make it a little less because your socks are. Um, they're not sided. You're not doing a left sock and a right sock, presumably. And right. your your big toe is really fighting against this angle. So if that angle wasn't quite as sharp, then your big toe would have a little less to fight against. And that's usually the nail and the and the toe that's wearing on the toe of a sock. 
Now, how many stitches do you go down to? Do you have to Kitchener? So I stopped here to 16, 18, 20. I went to 20 and then I from 30. Okay. It's usually like 16, so that's not bad. So I'm I'm within spitting distance. Mm -hmm. But and it's kind of an eyeball thing. And notice I'm ready to do my other toe right now. So if I didn't, if I wasn't ready to do my toe, I'd want to make sure I made a note of the number of stitches yeah. I went down to if I was if I was veering off of the pattern as I am wont to do. Okay, so let me just demonstrate this and then I'll go to the Kitchenering and then and then you'll be free of me for the week. So we're always going to do our decrease one stitch in from the end. So you're gonna have one stitch that is not a decrease. I'm gonna zoom on my zoom. And now I'm going to just demonstrate that same SSK that I got from Patty Lyons, the one that we are calling the Japanese kimono SSK. So normal, I'm gonna show you the normal SSK and then the Japanese kimono one. Normally when you do an SSK, you move the first stitch on your left needle knitwise, you slip it off knitwise, and then you slip another one off knitwise, and then you put the left needle into the fronts of those two slip stitches, and then you work them together, right? Yep. So that's that's the all the steps of a normal SSK. Well, there is a way to do this. I'm going to return them to the needle the way that they started. There is a way to do this that makes a slightly less elongated SSK. So it matches the knit two together a little bit better. And it eliminates one of those steps. Or it, it goes from being sort of a three-step to a two-step process. And that is to slip the first stitch completely off knitwise, and then pivot the right needle so that the left tip of the needle goes into the front of the stitch you just slipped, and the right needle tip goes into the back of the next stitch along the needle. So we call it the kimono sleeve because we think of it as like when you have those long kimono sleeves and you put both hands in. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, that kind of analogy? And then you wrap them just like you would the SSK. And it creates a somewhat less pronounced left-leaning decrease than the traditional SSK. And then at the end of the row, you're just going to do your knit two together. So I'll just work over to there and show you that. And then I'll turn and we'll do the SSK one more time, just so everybody has a chance to see it. So I've talked about this kimono sleeve SSK. Um, I learned it from Patty Lyons from her Bag of Knitting Tricks book. And I'm just, she doesn't call it kimono sleeve. That's my own. Uh, it's not my own name. Somebody in one of my classes called it that, and we we thought that was a perfect name. So here I'm going to do my knit two together. So I stop three stitches before the edge. I knit two together, knit the last one, and I'm going to turn and rearrange my magic loop. And I'm going to repeat that for the second side. So I knit one again, and here's my SSK. I'm gonna slip this knit wise, so it turns the stitch. I'm gonna put the left needle tip, I'm pivoting my right needle, the left needle tip goes in that, and then you go into the back of the next stitch. Like that, and you knit them together. And I think the place where I think this will make the most difference for knitters is when you're doing lace work and you have multiple SSKs across the row because you don't have to do that extra step of the second slipped stitch 
and then putting the left needle into the fronts of the two slip stitches and working them together. So it saves you one little step. And I'm always looking for a little bit more ergonomic or a little bit more um, streamlined technique. And I think that this technique is both a little bit more ergonomic and creates a nicer looking decrease. And uh, not that it makes that big a difference on the toe of a sock, <laughs> not that so many people are gonna be examining it and deciding that I have the wrong kind of decrease on the toe of my sock, but it's very satisfying to me to have good technique. I have one stitch too far. That is just a yarn over my needle. Okay, so I would continue doing those decreases. Again, as I said, I would be doing them every third round. And I just want to show you to look at those decreases. We were talking today also about being able to read your knitting. So when you put the stitches together in a decrease like that, it kind of looks like this at the bottom with one stitch coming out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's like here between my thumbs. You see those? Mm -hmm one, two, three legs, and then there's one stitch coming out of it. One. So I'm gonna put my, my needle under the three legs. One, two, three legs there. And then there's one stitch coming out of it. So if I saw that one stitch, I'd know that I'd done my decrease in the row before. So you have to see you have to see a second stitch. So if you were doing it every other round, my next round where I would have done a decrease is here. But as you can see, I've got an extra round in between. We've got one, two, and then I did a decrease here in three. So it's really helpful if you can look down and see if you've just done a decrease or if you need to do a decrease um, because it's very easy to get distracted while you're knitting the toes of a sock. It's quick and um, you need to keep track of being on the beginning of your round. These rounds go much faster than um, they do when you're knitting in pattern or when you have all of the stitches on. So do try and keep track of when you're at the beginning of a round and whether or not it's the round that you're gonna decrease in or work without any shaping. I have put my darning needle down again. Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. there's no darning without a needle. <laughs> the dog got it. No, it's here. <laughs> it, was, it was hiding over by the TV. Okay, so I'm ready to do this. You don't need a forever long strand, strand left, but you do need to be able to go about one, two, three times across, and then some. I like to have, you know, a little bit to play with. So a couple of feet is too much, but 18 inches is maybe fine. When you're doing grafting, Look at your work. So I've got my work set up so that I have two needle tips pointing to the right. Um, this could be on separate needles. This could be on double point needles. This could be on two circulars, but my needle tips are pointing to the right. My yarn is on the right-hand side. 
I'm facing the right side. So the right sides are facing out because I don't have the sock inside out, but I'm looking at the knit side of the bottom of my foot. And if I move that down, I'm looking at the purl side of the top of my foot, just because of how it's laying there. So that's something to keep in mind that you, the front needle looks like the, the knit side and the back needle looks like the purl side. And that can help you keep track of what you're doing in, in grafting. So when I graft, I like to process each section of the grafting separately and pull the darning needle through as I finish each section. So I do a setup row, not everybody does. And the setup is front needle, very bright. Hold please, let me see if I can make that a little less blurry. It's a little better. So the setup is front needle, I go purl wise into the stitch and I leave it on. And then I go into the, and I pivot my needle. I don't pull it all the way through. I pivot the darning needle. And then in the back needle, the first stitch on the back needle, I go in knit wise and I also leave it on. And then I pull through. So that front purl wise, leave on and pivot the needle looks like this. Front, go into that stitch purl wise. And I'm gonna, actually I have to pull through, sorry. Pull through. I can't pivot from there. I'm gonna keep my darning needle below the tips of my needles. So I'm not gonna do anything above here. I'm gonna stay underneath and I'm going to put my darning needle into the first stitch on the, on the back needle knit wise. So back knit wise and I leave that stitch on the, the back needle and I pull through the working yarn. So I've done my setup to work the, the graft, I'm going to now work the second part of it first on the front stitches. So I'm going to work the front stitches first, and I'm going to go knit wise in the first stitch, knit wise, and take it off and pivot. And then the second stitch, I'm going to go purl wise and on and pull through. And notice that that's exactly the same as the first step up there. So let's just see what that looks like. So I'm gonna go knit wise and off. That's the second time I went into that stitch. And then I'm gonna pivot and go purl wise into this stitch and pull through. You don't want your yarn to catch around your needles. So try and, I sometimes keep my finger over it. Then I'm gonna to go to the back stitches and on the first stitch of the back, I'm gonna go purl wise and off and pivot. And the second stitch, I'm gonna go knit wise and on, leave it on and pull through. And again, that's just like that one. And it looks like this. So I go in knit wise, sorry. Pearl wise. Pearl wise, yep. Pearl, Pearl wise and off. Don't pull the, the darning needle through. Then go knit wise into the first, or the next stitch. And now we're gonna pull the darning needle through. And I pull it fairly firmly when I finish that stitch. So now I've done the front and the back each. I'm gonna go back and do the front again. So knit wise and off, pivot, 
pearl wise and stay on. Okay, so keeping my pointer finger there to sort of guard that yarn from getting all caught up. The reason I don't pull my darning needle through until I'm done is once I've pulled it through, I can tell that I'm done with the front stitches. If I pulled it through in between these two steps and I got distracted, it would be really hard for me to look down and know if I'd done one or two of the front stitches because it's just, it's just hard to see it. So I like to pull my darning needle through as sort of a signal to me that I'm done with that side before I go back to the other side. So purl wise and off, knit wise and stay on, knit wise and off, purl wise and stay on, purl wise and off, knit wise and stay on. So it's interesting when I start, I start with the, you know, we've talked about the front needle being the knit, the knit side facing. And the back needle is the purl side facing. So you start with the opposite. If the front needle is knit and the back needle is purl, you start with the opposite. And if you can remember that you start with the opposite, it's really easy to memorize this going forward. So I'm going knitwise into this stitch. I haven't done, I, my yarn, I stopped and talked and got distracted, but my yarn is coming out of the back side. So I know where I am. I'm ready to do the front. So knitwise and in and off, purlwise and stay on, purlwise and off, pivot, knit wise and stay on knit purl purl knit i pull rather firmly i have a little bit of a loop there i didn't pull it very firmly when i started i can probably pull that through to the other side. There's my yarn coming out the back, so I'm back on the front. Pearl knit. I only found the littlest, tiniest needle today. <laughs> it's easier on a smaller needle, I think. It is. But it's a little fiddly. My fingers yeah. feel fat. They feel, they feel. I, like I don't do the setup row, and then I don't get the, if I do the setup row, I get the ears. Mm -hmm. So I don't do the setup row anymore. We discussed this today because I said I do know people who don't do the setup row. If you don't do the setup row, you should also not do the finishing row. Right. So I, I will. I will. I will elaborate that when I get to the end of this. Okay. Section, but um, can't talk and graft at the same time. I know. Curl and off, knit and on, almost there. So you do this, you repeat these sets over and over again until you get to the very last stitch on each needle. Not the last pair of stitches, but the last stitch on each needle. So you'll have worked halfway through each of those stitches. If 
And I think, sorry. Who's sick, Pam? Pam is very sick. I thought it was you because of your husband last week. No, but she told me that he made her sick. And I was like, he didn't make me sick. So what have you two been doing? Exactly. (laughs) When did he get out and get over to Pam's house is what I want to know. Yeah, right. (laughs) So... This is what it looks like on the top of my sock. Just this really smooth, almost unbroken line of stitches that I've created a a row of what's like knitted stitches. So I'm on the last two. And here we finish up the knit wise and off, purl wise and stay on, purl wise and off, knit wise and stay on. Now, if your name is Bernie, (laughs) it would just slip the, the stitches off of the two needles? Well, what I do is I go through one needle knitwise, one needle purl wise, and tuck it in. Well, then you do do the, you finish it up. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So, so the last part of it, the finish, the front, you go knitwise and off. Right. And you can pivot. And the back, pearl wise and off and pivot. And what's interesting is that's the same as those. Mm-hmm. So that looks like this knit wise and off, pearl wise and off. My needle is done. I can pull my working yarn through and I see a little bit of an ear there. However, if you take your darning needle, you can catch those two stitches if you want with the yarn and you can pull it in and it removes the ear. Yeah, that's what I do. So that's how I resolve the ears on my, on my sock is I just pull through to the Mm -hmm. other side so that the ear is buried in that corner. So that's the, the toe of my sock. And that's the, that's the shape that I feel like fits me the best. So it's awful short. Um, I think my socks are longer. Okay. I tried it on and I was like, yeah, I'm plenty. I'm plenty good, but if it is short, I will pull it out and redo it. But I had to get to the grafting part tonight. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I I may have to redo that, but hopefully it will fit because it was kind, it was a little, this, the sock felt a little bit long when I got to there. So the other thing I would say is when you're making socks for yourself, you get to keep trying them on and match things exactly. And make that's if you. And make them. That's fit. if you could fit, bend over and get them on your feet. That's if you can bend over and get them on your feet. <laughs> right. So I, that, I use the roller. Huh? I use the sock roller. The sock roller. And I mark where I have to knit to before I do my toes. And that works for me. Okay. The last thing I want to show uh, weaving in ends is pretty straightforward for most of the sock stuff, but I do like this little trick at the end for weaving in um, to create a seamless looking top. So where Mm -hmm. we started and we cast on, um, I like to do a little mock cast on stitch. So this, these stitches are looping around each other here. And so I'm gonna make this one look like it's looping around by coming back to where it's coming from. So that create, it looks like it's finished. And then when I weave it in, I weave it down the ribbing. And I just go back and forth under one of the halves of the ribbing there. One, two, three, maybe four times. And then I cross it back on itself 
so that it's kind of locked into place. And I find that that's enough to secure my end and it creates a nice, a much smoother top of my sock. Any questions? No. No. You know, I saw something interesting on people making scrappy socks. Yeah. So you don't have to weave in your ends. Yeah. Every other stitch you add your end that you're weaving in and it doesn't show. I haven't tried it yet, but look kind of interesting. Instead of like the Stephen West does winding it. Is that like the weave in Stephen? No, it's it's different. It's like you pick up a stitch, you wrap your arm around the front, and then you put it in the back, and then you knit a stitch. Can you say the name of a sock? I could go look at the pattern. No, I don't know whose it is. <laughs> I was just watching YouTubes this weekend. Okay, well, if, you, if you find that YouTube, send it to me. Okay. okay. But it's interesting because yeah. like she, she pulls it front and then she pulls, it's kind of when you do um, bare aisle, basically. Okay. I know the proud foot, she did the um, the slip stitch throughout. And so it made it so that you could like run your ends into those slips. Yeah. I'm just going to share my screen briefly. And oh, let me find, let me open it first. Um, I just want to say that today is the last day of this, of this sock. Congratulations if you've gotten to the end and uh, I'm, I hope you will get to the end if you haven't. Um, the next sock is called the Dip in the Road and it's on Ravelry. It's also on our website. And I'm gonna find it around the table yarns. Where do we, where do I live? Okay. So, could you see my screen? We did then, but not now. Okay, all right. We heard this, it's there. So, if you go to our website on calendar and resources on Project Monday, which is what Sock Club is part of, if you click on Sock Club, the I'm So Basic Socks, this is a link to the pattern. If you don't have it already, it is a free pattern that you can download from Ravelry. And then the videos for uh, the first day, the German Twisted Cast On for the heel flap, heel turn and gusset. And then today's will be here. And this will be toes and the video link will be here next month, starting April 1st um, on the zoom, Kate Atherley will be joining us. So mm -hmm. um, it's her pattern. And I'm just going to click on this to show you the pattern. It is also a top down sock, but it's a textured one. Um, it's a slight, slightly different. There won't be a ton that's different about it, but um, this was when she could meet with us. And so we were excited to have her come and talk about socks a little bit. So it's always it's always fun to have a teacher come on and tell us a little bit about her. Is that basically a rib on the foot? It is, it's a textured rib. Okay. It's it's not fancy. I mean, that maybe is a a seed stitch or a garter stitch right it's probably a garter stitch in between probably a garter stitch so it's probably purled every other row to make that um but it's an it's a nice looking sock uh -huh. and especially yes. for and you know some of us are not professional sock knitters some of us have done quite a few and some of us haven't. So I wanted right. to give our newer sock knitters a chance to do something with texture to really kind of dip their toes into it. So we're dipping, right. dipping our toes how... into dip in the road. This yes. is a paid pattern. So we will not reveal information from the pattern on our Zoom videos unless uh, unless Kate Atherley does. That's completely up yeah. to her. But I won't be saying things about it. Um, but Kate does the uh, the custom socks book, which I really love. 
um, and have used for a long time for these classes. Um, any, the, the pattern is one that I think will do really nicely with a solid yarn, but it will also probably do nicely with a slightly variegated yarn, a very highly, uh, like distractingly variegated yarn may or may not look so great with this. Depends on- Now your... she uses the same heel, right? I think she does. I mean, it's a very similar it heel. Like... It's a reinforced heel flap with a turn and gusset. Okay. And then okay. she does a no graft toe. Although these oh, kind of look like she she grafted the toe, so I'm not sure. Um, mm -hmm. But we're gonna so we're gonna do a different kind of a toe next time and do the no graft toe. Okay. So that that, nice. that is on April first at six p.m. Eastern time. Um, there's again, this is a free class that we run. It's free all year. The videos are free. They're they're left up per, in perpetuity, and it will go up shortly. Uh, when we stop, we are recording, right? <laughs> Please yeah. God tell me I'm recording. <laughs> yes, and we're recording. <laughs> it's been such a long day. Okay, so um, thank you very much for joining us for Sock Club. This is one of my favorite things that we do, and I hope you enjoy your I'm So Basic socks. Yeah, I, I loved it. I learned something new every single time. <laughs> thank you. I, I I watch all of them in the videos. If I don't get there online, I watch the videos. I learn something every single time. Well, I'm glad to hear that because like this one, you know, the kimono sleeve decrease is the only thing that I feel is really new, but it's it's like, I don't know, that's kind of worth the price of admission right there. Right. It's well, plus the fact the way you, you, you do the different kitchener, I never knew to pivot it. Oh. Good. I didn't know you could pivot it. I just go in and out, in and out, and talk to myself. But thank you. I I feel like if I don't do the pivot, if I pull my my yarn all the way out, I have a tendency to lose track of where I am. Oh, I talk to myself. Yes, but sometimes I get interrupted. And yeah, I yeah, I, I usually do it when I'm by myself and nobody's around. And nobody's around. So if you can do it by yourself with nobody around, otherwise, I do recommend the pivoting. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Thank you all very much. Have a great night. And uh, there is social Zoom at 730 if you're interested. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.